Hi everyone, uh, this is Roger Veer. It's uh, Saturday, August 19th. Uh, and I wanna show you guys a presentation that I originally I made for the Pantera Bitcoin group back in uh, March of earlier this year. But in light of everything that's going on with Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Legacy today, I think that this is very relevant. So uh, uh, keep in mind that these slides again are, are back from March. That was about, about six months ago, but I think they're still very relevant here. So we'll start off with a, what is Bitcoin, right? Of course, we all think we know what Bitcoin is, but I want to talk about why I think Bitcoin uh, is important. So right from the from the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, uh, the title is that it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Uh, I think that's important to keep in mind that that's the original title of the white paper. But uh, what makes up a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, right? We need to have good money. Cash means good money. And here are the characteristics that make something good money. And uh, we can start that it's, you know, easy to store, hard to counterfeit, of, uh, scarce, divisible, homogeneous. Uh, there, that's a little bit lacking in Bitcoin, but there's room for improvement there. Uh, anyhow, durable. And then uh, easy to transport. And uh, that's the one that I think we need to focus on a bit more. And Core and their roadmap are intentionally damaging Bitcoin's ease of transport by making the blocks full and the fees high and the confirmation times long and the double spins easy, that's damaging one of these incredibly important characteristics of Bitcoin that make Bitcoin useful as money. And if you damage any of these characteristics here, Bitcoin is then less useful as money than it otherwise would have been. So uh, it's very, very important not to damage any of these. And unfortunately, Core's roadmap is intentionally damaging the ease of transport for, for Bitcoin. And uh, if you've been around Bitcoin for a while, you'll know exactly what this chart is. And uh, again, this is back from March. Now we've been bumping up against the limit for a while here. But you can see for all of Bitcoin's history, the blocks were never, ever full. There was tons of room for, for additional transactions until uh, the beginning of this year. Around March, the blocks became completely full. And that, when the blocks became full, that caused the average confirmation time to skyrocket. Uh, around the time that I took this screenshot in March earlier this year, the average confirmation time was about two hours for a Bitcoin uh, transaction that previously would always be confirmed in, a, in about 10 minutes because there was always plenty of room uh, in the blocks for every transaction to be included. And around the same time uh, that the blocks became full, Everyone had to bid against each other for room in that block, and the big, the fees that people had to pay to use Bitcoin skyrocketed from being something very reasonable around a penny a transaction to where people were paying uh, a quarter of a million dollars per day in transaction fees just to use the Bitcoin network. And uh, the fees are somewhere in that same ballpark today. And right around that exact same time that the blocks became full and the fees skyrocketed, uh, Bitcoin's share of the total market cap plummeted. Uh, and we can see that right here. And back when I took this screenshot, it was still above 60%. Today, Bitcoin is below 50%. And that brings us back to the economic code of Bitcoin that I love to say is so incredibly important. And uh, a really basic concept in economics is something called substitute goods. And it's important to understand the definition of what a substitute good is. And substitute goods are two goods that could be used for the same purpose. If the price of one good increases, then demand for the substitute is likely to rise. So in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, there's a bunch of substitute goods, right? We have Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Monero, Dash, Dogecoin, take your pick. There's a, a thousand and one altcoins out there with similar characteristics. Some are certainly better than others. Some have bigger network effects than others, but uh, there's a lot of competition there and things like Shapeshift and the Jax.io wallet that make it so incredibly easy to convert from one Bitcoin to another make it really, really easy to substitute one of these cryptocurrencies for another if one's not working for you. And we saw that happen exactly uh, at the same time when the blocks became full and the fee skyrocketed and the confirmation delays increased uh, in a huge amount for Bitcoin. We saw Bitcoin's share of the market cap plummet at the exact same time the altcoins rose like crazy. And that's because people are using altcoins as a substitute good for Bitcoin. Because if Bitcoin's no longer the easiest, fastest, and the cheapest and safest way for them to use their, their money, 
they're going to start using one of these substitute goods. And that's why we've seen the altcoins just uh, skyrocket uh, as far as their total market cap goes. And the reason for that is because we have these people at, at Bitcoin Core and Blockstream. And uh, they openly and intentionally advocate for one megabyte blocks. And they intentionally and openly advocate that they want to create high fees on the Bitcoin network. And they openly state that they want the blocks to be full. And uh, that causes a horrible user experience for Bitcoin. And uh, full blocks lead to high fees, long waits, and a horrible user experience. Anybody that's tried to use Bitcoin recently knows that the fees are crazy, the waits for confirmation are crazy, and just the overall user experience is horrible. Uh, before I decided to make this video this morning, I sent a Bitcoin transaction, and I think it was uh, like $70, $75 in fees. Uh, I can pull it up here while, while we... Uh, do that but it's just uh you know what an incredibly incredibly frustrating thing for someone that's been involved in bitcoin you realize that uh for the entire history of bitcoin up until the time the blocks became full you could send and receive any amount of money with anyone anywhere in the world and it was basically free you can't say that anymore now it's incredibly expensive so uh it was 59 dollars to send uh some bitcoins there earlier this morning uh the there's a lot of substitute goods that are cheaper and easier to, uh, and faster than, than Bitcoin. The only thing that's lacking for those other ones are the, the giant network effect that Bitcoin has and that first mover advantage. But uh, if we have you know this horrible user experience, that's going to result in fewer users, fewer nodes, lower adoption, and a lower Bitcoin market cap. And I hear so many of these Bitcoin Core and Blockstream supporters saying, oh, look at Bitcoin. It's at an all-time high uh, in price. Yeah, that's true, but we have to stop and think for a minute. If Bitcoin had continued to have a good user experience, what would the price be today? Maybe instead of it being $4,000 per Bitcoin today, we would already be at $40,000 per Bitcoin today. But instead, Bitcoin has this horrible user experience. People are starting to use Ethereum and Dash and altcoins and this and that. Whereas otherwise, if Bitcoin had continued to have a good user experience, they would have just continued to use Bitcoin. And that brings us back to the economics. If you get the economics wrong, it doesn't matter how good of a programmer you are. The economic code is incredibly important when it comes to Bitcoin. And we have some quotes here from Bitcoin Core and, and Blockstream supporters. And here's Greg Maxwell, the CTO of Blockstream, openly saying that he doesn't think that transaction fees mattering are a failing. It's a success. And we can see right here, when the transaction fees skyrocketed, Bitcoin's total share of the market cap of crypto coins plummeted, and I've provided the links to all of these quotes right in the bottom of uh, these slides. All of these slides, this whole presentation is available over at uh, rogerveer.com. If you click on the slideshow link at the bottom, you can download all of these, and this, the name of this one is Pantera, March 2017. And again, we have Greg Maxwell saying that fee pressure is an intentional part of the system design and to the best of the current understanding, essential for the system's long-term survival. So yes, it's good. And I'd like to point out once again that as soon as the fees skyrocketed on Bitcoin, Bitcoin's total share of the market cap plummeted. And at the time I took this screenshot back in March, it was at 60-something percent. Now it's below 50 percent. Uh, so it's gone down even more. So uh, if you get the economics wrong, it doesn't matter how good of a computer scientist you are or a computer programmer or any of the other stuff. You have to have the economics right or the system's not going to not gonna work. And again, here we have uh, Greg Maxwell saying there's nothing wrong with full blocks. But we can see incredibly clearly that there's something horribly, horribly, horribly wrong with full blocks. As soon as the blocks became full, Bitcoin's market share plummeted. Absolutely plummeted because the user experience becomes horrible with full blocks. And again, we have Greg Maxwell saying full blocks is the natural state of the system. But that's absolutely ridiculous. We can see here in the picture here we have the you know eight-year history of Bitcoin. Uh, the blocks weren't full until very, very recently. So the full block certainly is not the natural state of the system. Uh, and we should never, ever, ever have full blocks. It creates this horrible user experience. Uh, for, for the users of Bitcoin and forces them to start using things other than Bitcoin. Again, Greg Maxwell, uh, I'm not trying to pick on him any more than anybody else, just there were plenty of quotes from him because he loves to post all, all over the internet. Um, and he says, there's a, cons 
there's a consistent fee backlog, which is the required uh, which is the required criteria for stability. And again, that's nonsense. Um, it wasn't until very recently that the blocks became full and the fee skyrocketed, and that happened in sync with the Bitcoin share of the crypto coin market space just plummeting. So uh, I'm sure Greg knows a lot of things about a lot of uh, interesting topics. Um, the economic code of Bitcoin is not one of them. Uh, Peter Wheely, he says, We as a community should indeed let a fee market develop, and rather sooner than later. And again, I'm sure Peter's a really smart guy about a lot of things. He has a PhD, but the economic code that has made Bitcoin a success is not one of the things that he's knowledgeable about. Uh, and again, we can see in the charts here that as soon as the Bitcoin uh, transaction fees skyrocketed, Bitcoin share of the crypto coin market space plummeted. We have Mark Friedenbach. I'm sh again, I'm sure he's a smart guy about a lot of things and very well informed about a lot of things. The economic code that has made Bitcoin a success is not one of them. And he says, slow confirmation, high fees will be the norm in any safe outcome. Uh, no, if we have slow confirmations and high fees, we're going to see Bitcoin be replaced by you know the 1,001 substitute goods that are out there waiting to replace Bitcoin. And we can see that from the charts here, that uh, when the average confirmation time became really long because of the full blocks, Bitcoin's share of the overall crypto coin market space has plummeted. And Luke Jr., reasonable block sizes currently range from 550 kilobytes to 1 megabyte. Uh, absolute nonsense. Um, I don't think there's too many sane people in the world that think that that's a good idea. Uh, it's going to be the, the end of Bitcoin if, if we restrict the block size and create this horrible user experience for all the users of Bitcoin. And again, Luke Jr. says uh, it's no longer possible to keep fees low. Uh, that's just absolute nonsense. Uh, the reason fees are so high is because Bitcoin had this giant network effect. There were already a million apps for smartphones and computers and Bitcoin exchanges and merchants that accept Bitcoin. So there's definitely a lot of stickiness that prevents people to, from wanting to switch from, something, uh, from, from Bitcoin to something else. But if the fees get too high and the, the confirmation times get too long and the user experience gets too bad... People are start are, are going to switch, and we're, we've seen that happen in a major way, and that's specifically because the blocks were were allowed to become full because these Bitcoin Core and Blockstream guys, in their you know ignorance of the economic code of Bitcoin, thought that that would be a good idea, and uh, I wouldn't be so passionate about this if I didn't own a, a bunch of bitcoins. I I want to see Bitcoin do well, and again we have Luke Jr. saying, just pay a five dollar fee and it'll go through every time unless you're doing something stupid. Well. Maybe that was pr approximately true back in March when he said that, but uh, just this morning I paid $59 uh, for my fee, uh, and I got included in the next block, but I own the, the fee for that was 290 Satoshis per byte, so it wasn't a, a miscalculation on the fee. That's about what the fees are need to be at the moment. So, uh, And uh, I was sending those Bitcoins that I sent this morning, I was sending them to an exchange to trade them for something other uh, than Bitcoin. So... Uh, Thanks, thanks, Luke. Uh, George Tiemann, another Blockstream and Bitcoin uh, core uh, participant uh, and a Blockstream employee, he says, higher fees may be just what is needed. Uh, that's absolute nonsense. Uh, no, higher fees are kryptonite to the adoption of Bitcoin and to the user base of Bitcoin. And we can see that plain as day from these charts here. When the fees became really high to use Bitcoin, Bitcoin's percentage of the total market cap uh, of cryptocurrencies plummeted. So no, George, higher fees is exactly what the system doesn't need. Bitcoin is supposed to be fr frictionless or as close to frictionless as we can make it peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, not some sort of settlement layer with high fees and slow uh, confirmation times. And again, we have George here saying uh, confirmation times are fine for those who pay high fees. Uh, no, if the fees become high, people are going to switch to using a cryptocurrency that has fast confirmation times. Uh, and it's worth noting that maybe a lot of people that are new to Bitcoin in the early days of Bitcoin, the policy was first seen, first safe. That, and that meant that when you broadcasted your transaction to the network, once it had been broadcasted to the network, 
you were pretty much good to go. And people commonly accepted Bitcoin transactions for you know tens of thousands of dollars without waiting for a confirmation, uh, depending on the exact circumstances. And you can make Bitcoin zero confirmation transactions very, very, very safe. Certainly not as safe as a, a transaction that's already had a confirmation or, or, or more, but you can make them where they're safe enough to where most of the time people can accept them for most of the things in their life and it becomes good enough for, for most things. And that should be the goal. Whereas unfortunately, Bitcoin Core and Blockstream have intentionally uh, undermined the safety of zero confirmation uh, transactions. And that degrades the user experience and that'll make people want to go and seek out coins that provide a better user experience and use those as a substitute for Bitcoin. And that's exactly what we've seen uh, happening over the last uh, few months. And again, we have George saying, Bitcoin needs a competitive fee market in the long run to sustain proof of work once the subsidies are gone. Uh, I'm very happy that we have it now. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to that argument um, that someday when there's no more block reward whatsoever, we need some fees to incentivize the miners to secure the network. But the block reward doesn't run out for another 100 years. We have more than 100 years until this becomes a problem. And instead of waiting for 100 years to solve this problem, uh, they're, cause, they're causing a problem right now today. They're causing a giant problem on the Bitcoin network today that's causing people to use things other than Bitcoin. So uh, because of some problem that might exist more than 100 years from now, they're intentionally causing a problem today. So that's... Uh, shows a clear uh, lack of understanding of the economic code that's made Bitcoin a success today. The Bitcoin economic code that made Bitcoin a success is the exact same one that we had for the first eight years, which was low fees and fast confirmation times for everybody. And uh, they're altering that economic code to disastrous results here. And again, we say that uh, George, uh, in reference to Adam Back, the CEO of Blockstream, he says, I think Adam and I agree that hitting the limit wouldn't be bad, but actually good for a young and immature market like Bitcoin fees. This is absolute nonsense. This is kryptonite to Bitcoin. Bitcoin had an amazing growth rate the first eight years of Bitcoin when the fees were essentially, you know, basically nothing. You were talking about a penny to use Bitcoin. And Bitcoin went from nobody using it to somewhere around, you know, 10 plus million users around the world. Huge amounts of venture capital coming in, a huge adoption for merchants. It was amazing. Uh, and we have an eight-year track record knowing that that economic code worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin and get Bitcoin used by more and more people around the world. If you know something works and works incredibly well, don't change it. Yet here's George claiming that he and Adam want to change this economic code that we already know works to some economic code that we don't know uh, works. Uh, and in fact, we have a whole bunch of uh, evidence to say that it doesn't work and it drives people to use something other than Bitcoin. So if something's not broken, don't fix it. Yet that's exactly what these people are trying to do. Uh, and here's a quote from Vladimir Vanderlan, who uh, is with a contributor to Bitcoin Core. And he says, a mounting fee pressure resulting in a true fee market where transactions compete to get into blocks results in urgency to develop decentralized off-chain solutions. Um, and we have these charts here showing that Bitcoin, when the fees became high and the fee pressure was there, Bitcoin's share of uh, market cap plummeted. So, yeah, it made some people develop off-chain solutions for Bitcoin, meaning using Bitcoin banks like, uh, you know, Coinbase and Zappo and, and, and Bitcoin exchanges that hold the Bitcoins for the users, which is exactly what Bitcoin was supposed to avoid. We want everyone to hold their Bitcoins themselves in a wallet in which they control the keys. And in addition to doing that, it's pushed all sorts of people to start using things other than Bitcoin. There's all sorts of companies that used to be Bitcoin-only companies that have started adopting Bitcoin. So Coinbase used to be a Bitcoin-only company. And now they've integrated Litecoin and Ethereum, and they've announced they're going to integrate Bitcoin Cash. Uh, we just saw earlier this week, bl uh, blockchain.info, the number one Bitcoin wallet in the entire world that's responsible for more Bitcoin transactions than any other or than all other wallets combined, just integrated Ethereum. Uh, I, I'm the very first investor in the entire world in blockchain.info. I'm still the largest shareholder in the entire world uh, in, in blockchain.info, uh, almost more than all the other shareholders combined. Um, 
Blockchain had no desire to integrate any other altcoins other than Bitcoin. And the only reason that they integrated something other than Bitcoin at this point is because they were forced to because of the horrible user experience for, for Bitcoin users on the Bitcoin network because of the full blocks and the high fees. If that wasn't the case, we would have been happy just going along with Bitcoin uh, forever. So we've seen Coinbase integrate altcoins, Blockchain and Info integrate altcoins, all sorts of what used to be Bitcoin exchange ha exchanges have been now become cryptocurrency exchanges and are busy integrating altcoins. Uh, that's because of the horrible user experience that was brought about uh, on Bitcoin because of the full blocks and high fees and slow confirmation times that they bring. Uh, it's kryptonite to the future growth of Bitcoin. And again, we have Vladimir here saying, I'm afraid increasing the block size will kick this uh, can down the road and let people and the large Bitcoin companies relax. Saying that, that it's going to let them relax, that's exactly what we want people using Bitcoin to be able to do. We want them to be able to relax and have a wonderful user experience and have Bitcoin work beautifully for them. Uh, that's... That's the name of the game when it comes to customer service and, and user adoption. We want people to have a good experience and be able to relax and just be able to use Bitcoin and not worry about it. And instead, they're causing these intentional problems on the network. And we see, can see in these charts again, as soon as we hit the one megabyte limit, Bitcoin's percentage of the total market cap plummeted. So what can we do about it? Um, so I made these slides six months ago, but the answer is still basically the same, right? Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited at the time was advocating bigger blocks, lower fees, and faster confirmations. And it also enables Layer 2 scaling. So we get all the benefits from the Lightning Network and all these fancy Layer 2 stuff, plus lower fees and confirmations, uh, faster confirmations. That's exactly what we want. Uh, and Bitcoin Cash has the exact same thing today. We already have bigger blocks. We're seeing all the transactions being included right in the next block. The fees are some very, very small fraction of what it is on the Bitcoin uh, legacy system. And we can build all sorts of layer two stuff on top of this as well. And Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin Cash's plan leads to better money, right? Hard. It has all of these things, including the easy to, easy to transport part. Bitcoin legacy is not easy to transport. It's incredibly expensive and super slow to do that. And that's not what good money is. And again, if we have better money, better money leads to more users, more nodes, more adoption, and more censorship resistance. Uh, with a higher, and all those things will lead to a higher market cap and a higher price. And we're seeing that happen right before our eyes with Bitcoin Cash today. So many people are selling their slow and not easy to use and expensive to move uh, Bitcoins and buying Bitcoin Cash. And the miners are going to switch, and whichever cryptocurrency has these characteristics as money is going to be the ones that uh, people use. And Bitcoin had this giant, giant, just, you know, light year head start on all these other cryptocurrencies in terms of uh, network effect and user adoption. And that's been absolutely squandered and destroyed and, and smashed by this idiotic full block high fee policy of Blockstream and Core. Um, I don't think that they're bad people. I think they just don't understand the economic code that's made Bitcoin a success. And they've altered that to the detriment of Bitcoin. And that's why we've seen Bitcoin and now Bitcoin Cash. I'm sorry, that's why we've seen Ethereum and now Bitcoin Cash just coming up like leaps and bounds. And uh, if Bitcoin Legacy continues to have this bad user experience, 100% of its first mover advantage uh, is going to be destroyed because of Blockstream's uh, full block and high fee policy. And uh, that brings us to where we are today. If you're wondering what crypto coins you should hold, look at this chart here. All of them are hard to counterfeit, right? Uh, look for the ones that are scarce and have a limited supply. Uh, all of them are basically divisible. Um, homogeneous is just another name for, for privacy. So Bitcoin, in addition to the scaling issue, has a really big problem with the homogeneousness, right? Bitcoin needs to have more privacy built in. So look at crypto coins that have more privacy built in. So you have uh, some top contenders there are Z, Zcash, uh, Dash, maybe the privacy is a little bit weaker, but still seems to be better than Bitcoin. Uh, Monero, of course, uh, Zcoin, and uh, I'm sure there's a number of others out there. So keep an eye on those. Um, and that's another big problem with the full block and high, uh, high fee policy that, uh, implemented by Blockstream and Core. It makes it too expensive for people to use privacy tools like Bitcoin mixers. 
and that damages the the homogeneousness of Bitcoin. If it's too expensive to use a mixer, then people aren't going to use it anymore, and that damages Bitcoin's characteristics as, as money. If you have you know big blocks where people can shuffle all their coins around, that improves the privacy of Bitcoin, and that makes Bitcoin better money again. So they've damaged this aspect of uh, of Bitcoin as well with their full block and high fee policy. Uh, of course, Bitcoins and all these other crypto coins are durable. But easy to transport. Bitcoin has had that incredibly damaged uh, with this full block and high fee policy. So uh, anyhow, if you're shopping for other crypto coins, here's the characteristics to look for. Uh, I would like Bitcoin to have all of those in spades again. Uh, Bitcoin Cash looks like it has a, a pretty good j uh, chance of doing that again. But it has nowhere near the market effect of Bitcoin. There's no easy to use smartphone apps. There's pretty good adoption from exchanges. Uh, there's minimal adoption from merchant service providers at this point. So it's a bit of the chicken and egg problem. Uh, but every single Bitcoin holder is also a Bitcoin cash holder. So uh, a lot of these people are going to be interested, especially when when uh, we're seeing the price go crazy for it. Uh, we should check the, the price again since I didn't check from the time I started this uh, little screencast. But it's just been going crazy. It was a... Uh, Less than it was about three hundred dollars forty eight hours ago, and now it's up around a thousand dollars at the moment. And uh, yeah, what what an exciting thing! So anyhow, I don't need this to go too long. We're almost up to a, a half an hour, but uh, better money leads to all of these things that we want. And uh, it's worth pointing out the two that the goal is not decentralization. The goal is censorship resistance, and we we don't need an infinite amount of decentralization but we want as much censorship resistance as we possibly can have. And we just use the decentralization as the tool to achieve that censorship resistance. So the decentralization in and of itself is not the goal. It's simply the tool we use to achieve that censorship resistance. And we just need enough decentralization to achieve that censorship resistance. So uh, that's me. For anybody who's watching this video who doesn't know who I am, uh, I'm the very first person in the entire world to start investing in Bitcoin startups. Uh, I've been involved in Bitcoin since February of 2011. Uh, I was the first uh, investor in blockchain.info. I was uh, in the earliest round for, for BitPay and Ripple and Purse.io and Kraken and Shapeshift and a whole bunch of other companies that are no longer around as well. And I started investing in the Bitcoin system years before traditional venture capital started getting involved. Uh, I got involved because I want to see Bitcoin uh, and if it's not Bitcoin, I'll be a bit sad, but I'm just fine if it's another cryptocurrency. But I want to see Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies replace every other government-issued currency in the world. I want to see it replace the dollar, the euro, and the yen, and put every single human being on the planet on the same foothold, uh, on the same footing for being able to send and receive money with anyone else anywhere in the world without requiring permission from any politician or, or government or, or anybody for that matter. Uh, because that's what it's all about. We're all human beings. Uh, we all have the same natural rights. Uh, we should all be able to transact and send and receive money with each other without having to get the permission of strangers living in far off lands. Uh, that's why I got involved with Bitcoin. That's my goal. Today, I'm the CEO of Bitcoin.com. If you want to learn more about Bitcoin, go to Bitcoin.com. Uh, unlike uh, uh, BitcoinTalk.org or Bitcoin.org or our Bitcoin, uh, will allow you to go and say anything you want on our forums. Uh, we're not going to uh, delete your post or censor your 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 position just because of uh, you might disagree with uh, somebody on how Bitcoin should scale. But uh, anyhow, that's it. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, I'll probably do an AMA uh, at some point in the very near future on RBTC because they support uh, free speech there. So uh, look for my AMA coming soon too. Uh, thank you guys all for supporting uh, the this fundamentally world changing technology. Uh, Learn more at Bitcoin.com. Thank you all.